Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this virtual gallery walk with um, Sarah Walcott from the International Quilt Museum. Today, we're looking at the exhibit at the Iowa Quilt Museum titled Beautiful Simplicity, Two Color Quilts. And Sarah was gracious enough to curate this exhibit for us. Sarah is the collections manager at the International Quilt Museum. Um, and we both agreed that we'll be really careful about not saying the IQM because we both um, shorten our institutions to the IQM. So we've got the Iowa Quilt Museum and the International Quilt Museum. Um, Sarah has been the collections manager there for two years. She shared with me earlier and has been on um, at, the quilt at the International Quilt Museum in some capacity since 2014. So in just a moment, I'll let Sarah introduce herself. Um, sorry, I'm bouncing back and forth. We've still got people coming in from the waiting room. So um, just a couple of Zoom housekeeping things before we get to going too far. Um, we will ask you to stay muted and to keep your video off for the time being. We'll turn those on at the end for a Q&A session. Um, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question during the presentation, you are absolutely encouraged to do that. Um, just please use the chat window and I will continue monitoring that. Um, if you haven't found your chat window yet, um, for me on my computer, I, I mouse down to the bottom of my screen and it kind of appears chat with a little um, thought bubble. You also may find it near your participants area. Um, of course, if you aren't able to chat it in um, during the presentation, we'll open things up for Q&A at the end. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded and it will go on to our website following um, this morning. It'll take me a few hours to get there, um, but we will have that available for people to watch and view if you know somebody who wasn't able to join us this morning. Sarah's got a cute puppy with her this morning. <laughs> Hopefully they behave. <laughs> yeah. So um, before I turn things over to Sarah, I just want to give a quick overview of the Iowa Quilt Museum. If anybody's joining us for the first time, we are located in Winterset, Iowa, which is just about 30 minutes southwest of the Des Moines Metro. Um, Winterset is also the home of the Covered Bridges of Madison County and it's the birthplace of actor John Wayne. And so we have six remaining bridges that visitors can see. And there is a, a museum dedicated to John Wayne as his birthplace. So there's lots to see and do here in Winterset. We're also, our downtown district is on the National Historic Registry. And we have this beautiful shopping district down here with um, fun stores, um, boutiques, dining and that kind of thing. So if you haven't yet made it to Winterset, put that on your bucket list. We also have two fantastic quilt shops just steps away from the museum. One is literally our next door neighbor and the other is about six stores down the sidewalk on the same side of the square. So we would love to visit, have you visit Winterset when the time is right for that again. Um, as I mentioned, our current exhibit is Beautiful Simplicity. It's all two color quilts and Sarah Wolcott is our curator for that. And so I'll turn it over to Sarah right now. Sarah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the International Quilt Museum and then just a little bit of overview about this exhibit, if you would, please. Of course. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. So as Megan said, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm the collections manager at the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I've been there since about 2014 in some capacity. Um, I did my master's degree at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in textile history and was able to do a bunch of internships and various projects at the International Quilt Museum during that time, um, which was super valuable and really um, cemented my love of quilts. And so uh, the International Quilt Museum, as I, I mentioned, is in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, similarly to what Megan said, it's a great place to visit once it's safe for us all to be traveling again, which will hopefully be sooner than later. Um, we have uh, the world's largest publicly held collection of quilts. Um, 
We have over 8,000 objects in our collection, um, thousands of quilts, and then a couple thousand more quilt related objects. So that includes everything from sewing machines to batting samples to um, mountain mist printing plates, um, all kinds of fun stuff. And then um, we also have a pretty robust a schedule of exhibitions that involve pieces borrowed from other artists and other institutions. So it's um, often really a mix of historical and contemporary exhibitions in our galleries. So um, this exhibition, as Megan mentioned, um, is all two color quilts. So these quilts um, are from our education collection at the International Quilt Museum. And um, those quilts are quilts that we are able to um, send out a little bit more freely than our permanent collection. They don't have the same light and security restrictions. And um, so we really like sending those out because it's just a great way to get our quilts out to more places. Um, and this was a fun exhibition because in order to really make the exhibition robust. I got to go through and um, pull a few pieces that were in our permanent collection into education, um, which often happens when a piece maybe is starting to fade a little bit or just starting to not be in um, quite as good a shape or if we kind of go through and realize it's um, that we have several in the permanent collection that are pretty similar. And so um, a few of these have um, never been exhibited as part of our exhibition or part of our education collection before. So that was kind of fun. Um, so I picked two color quilts because I think um, that it's a really interesting way that makers kind of force the person looking at the quilt, force is a strong word, encourage the person looking at the quilt to um, notice other things that sometimes get lost when really busy fabrics are used, um, which are really fun in their own way. But, um, and some of these aren't technically two color, but they read that way, um, which is another thing I think is interesting. Um, often it could be the way that a dye faded or something like that, that if they, you put the quilt together and they look like the same color, but if they are slightly different dye lots, they may look quite a bit different a hundred years later. Um, so, and some of them do have really small prints that read as solids from a little ways away. So I think um, people definitely making do and um, choosing um, elements to incorporate into their quilts that kind of really highlight that the visual interest of the pattern itself and sometimes of the quilting stitches that we sometimes lose when in a really um, variegated colored quilt. Mm -hmm. so. so Sarah, a, um, here we go, two colored quilts, that's not a new kind of phenomenon. That's not really the word I'm looking for, but this is something, this is a, a type of quilt making design choice that has been around for a long time. Like I think the earliest quilt in this collection is dated to late 1800s, um, but it's also something that still happens a lot today. Um, we have two books in our gift shop right now that are modern or contemporary patterns of blue and white quilts specifically, or just two color quilts. Um, so why do you think that that style choice has lasted, has kind of withstood the test of time? Um, I think for a few reasons. I think the visual impact of a two color quilt is, um, it remains interesting. And a lot of the time, I think they tend to look a little bit less dated than um, a quilt that might incorporate six or eight colors that are really popular when the quilt is made, um, but then look um, very of that moment, um, okay. 20 or 30 years later. Um, I'm thinking specifically about um, like some, if you look at a quilt that was, there are certain quilts you can look at it and immediately know that that was made in the 1990s or that was made yeah. in the 1970s. And I think it can be a lot 
harder to tell with two color quilts. And I think that kind of um, visual, the visual simplicity that they have makes them um, feel a little bit more timeless mm -hmm. and um, also makes them just more likely maybe to stick around or to be included in the collections of individual collectors because they are less likely to kind of, they blend in a little better. They're less likely to clash with an existing collection or an existing um, home or decor style. Sure. And something that, I guess the more elements then the more possibility for clashing. Sure. Kind of, sure. Um, I, I'm thinking of kind of a, maybe an offbeat analogy, but kind of like how the little black dress um, is in a standard of a woman's wardrobe for you know decades and decades in one form or another. But the polyester leisure suit definitely came and went. Um, yes, that was that's exactly. very of the moment. Um, so I think that that's a really good point that um, the two color quilts have a little bit more staying power because they're a little bit less um, faddish. Um, yeah. And I think it's also just a really striking, some patterns I think specifically lend themselves to two colors more than others. Mm -hmm. um, and you can expand on that a little bit. Um, for example, I didn't really intentionally mean to um, make a two color quilt, but I did in the last quilt I made, it was an Irish chain. Um, and I know that there are Irish chains with multiple colors, but this one, you know, it also lends itself really well to just two colors. Um, and I'm. I'm looking across the gallery, which I'll show a picture in in just a little bit of this um, Rob Peter to pay Paul or the, the orange peel mm -hmm. um, and um, something like a drunkard's path. You know, they just really lend themselves well to two colors, um, partially because the actual piecing is so intricate. If you throw more colors on that, it really becomes busy, so to say. Yes. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And I think um, with just two colors, you create a really, usually create a really clear sense of like positive and negative space within the quilt. And I think that's, um, I think it's appealing in the way, in a way that's consistent with what the uh, appeal of quilts is for a lot of people. I think that um, not, <laughs> I guess not to be, um, it sounds like a terrible pun, which is not how I mean it, but like you want a place for your eye to rest, particularly on a quilt. And when you have um, that really clear um, sense of the design, then um, it's more, it's still interesting to look at, but it's a little bit more restful than um, chaotic, which I think is a thing about quilts and admiring quilts that is, mm -hmm. uh, it makes them kind of very accessible generally. And so I think that's a piece of that accessibility, this kind of, um, that they're able to be still like technically very impressive and aesthetically beautiful, but also um, relatively quite simple. Sure. So in just a second, I wanna as have you share with us some of your, um, ideas about how exactly you curate an exhibit? How do you choose what goes into a particular exhibit? Because I think that that's a question a lot of people have. Um, but I'm gonna go a little bit broader and talk about how we here at the Iowa Quilt Museum um, choose our exhibit schedule. Obviously we only have one gallery at a time um, and we want to show a variety of quilts, both historic and contemporary and different genres, including art quilts and modern quilts. Um, and so we do try to place exhibits back to back that will be different um, so that um, if you didn't care for last exhibit, this will be something totally different. So it's interesting. Um, I don't know that we exactly um, planned it this way, but the exhibit right before this one was out of control quilts and they came from the collection of Barbara Brackman and Deb Rowden in Lawrence, Kansas. And they were all historic quilts, but they were very... Um, they, they didn't really have a place for your eye to rest, to borrow your um, term there. They were a little bit chaotic and busy and lots of different things happening. And so I think it's kind of interesting that this exhibit has come right after that because it is much more restful. Um, and anecdotally, my own daughter, who is very kind of 
in the box with the way she likes to see the world happen. She did not care for the out of control exhibit <laughs> at all. She came in once and then like, she kind of wouldn't come in the gallery anymore until those quilts <laughs> were gone. But she loves this exhibit because this is what quilting means to her mm -hmm. is as pattern and order and repetition of that pattern and order. Um, and so it's, it really is a restful exhibit. Um, so that's kind of how we um, plan our exhibits anyway, is trying to show a variety. Um, we also, our mission states that we are um, here to celebrate the American quilt and the art of quilt making, specifically in the American tradition. And now that differs a little bit from the International Quilt Museum, obviously by the name International. I've seen some really wonderful um, pieces at your museum outside, the, outside of the American tradition. But anyway, talk to us a little bit about how when you're approaching an exhibit and you're curating a collection, how do you decide what gets included and what kind of makes the cut, so to speak? Okay, so I guess I'll talk about um, how we curate our collection first. Okay. Um, so the three, there are kind of three factors that determine whether a piece will enter our collection. And um, those are provenance, condition and then rarity within our collection. Um, and so provenance just means, do we know who made it? Do we know when? Do we know where? Um, do we have any kind of documentation of any of that? Or is that, um, you know, is that the family information? Is that dealer information? Is that just what an eBay seller said? Um, <laughs> and so all those things are kind of as you can imagine, um, hold different weights of um, how accurate we can assume them to be. And um, so, and obviously the most direct provenance we can get is a quilt that is like signed and dated. Mm -hmm. Then we know for sure. Um, and then it kind of goes down from there. Um, and so that's a big piece of it. Condition is huge because we don't do um, conservation on site. Um, and it's very expensive to send quilts out to be conserved. And so um, we, with very rare exceptions, um, basically those other two factors I talked about would have to be really, really strong in order us to, for us to take in a piece that was not in exhibitable condition. Um, and so that's what um, probably turns away the majority of the donation offers that we have to turn away is just, um, they're just not in a condition that um, we would be able to exhibit. Um, and then the final one is just rarity within our collection. So do we have other quilts like it? Is it um, a better example of say, a grandmother's flower garden than any of our other 11 examples. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, if not, then um, we have a list where donations are concerned. We have a list of um, nine or 10 other museums with quilt collections throughout the country that we are able to connect people with um, because they are actively building their collections um, and they have um, maybe people don't necessarily think of them or know, or even know about them. And so that way um, we're able to still help people find a home for their quilts, even if mm -hmm. it's not something we can take in. Um, and then when it comes to curating an exhibition, like this one, um, curating from the education collection can be a little bit more of a challenge sometimes, but um, just because it's a lot smaller, it's about 300 quilts instead of several thousand. And so um, finding quilts that, I don't know, look good together and that don't clash and that still um, tell a meaningful story can be a little trickier. But obviously, as I mentioned, I kind of cheated by pulling a few <laughs> into the education collection, but they were ready to go. Um, it was their time. So I was glad to be able to include them. Um, and so I guess the things that I thought about um, were just that it was interesting to me that this is, um, as Megan and I kind of talked about, um, a style of quilt making that has really stood the test of time. People have been doing this for um, centuries, making two color quilts. 
and um, also that not just that it was interesting to quilt makers to do this, but also that um, in the various parts of our collection, various um, collectors had, it's, these quilts had clearly spoken to them. They had collected many of them. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting too, because even more than with um, a quilt that someone might make for their own personal use, which a lot of these quilts would have been, um, collectors are very directly trying to tell a story, I think, with their collection. Um, They're specifically choosing things that are quilts that are already made to include in a collection that tells um, the story of their view of quilts and which quilts are interesting and valuable. And so um, I thought it was interesting that in these various collections um, within our larger collection, there were several um, different collectors and um, a couple of makers who had really felt like these two color quilts were interesting enough to collect several of and in really different color combinations. There are some very, very classic like red and white, blue and white, pink and white, things like that. And then there are some really oddball kind of um, more strange pieces like brown and black or um, kind of purplish blue and green, things like that, um, that you wouldn't necessarily think about putting together, but they're really, I don't know, kind of fun and striking um, when you do see them. So I think that's a great segue. I'm going to go ahead and pull up some pictures here um, from the gallery. Sarah, can you see the, yeah. the photos? Okay. All right. So we first got some just overview shots um, of two or three or more quilts at a time, just to give you an example of what it is that we're looking at. Um, the one on the left, I affectionately refer to as the Charlie Brown quilt um, <laughs> because it reminds me of the chevron on the front of his shirt. And um, my kids just made me watch the Peanuts movie um, the other day, which has been out for a couple of years, but it was, it was a delightful little movie. Um, and then of course, a classic feathered star um, is a great um, outlet for two colors as well. Um, such an intricate pattern. Yeah, it can go over. Um, now this one on the right, which is just kind of a total puzzle. Um, I've never seen anything quite like that before. So I'm interested to have you tell us about that one in a little bit, Sarah, once we get into the, um, the pictures of each individual quilt. Yeah, the, the purple and green one that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and that again, that is, I expected as we were kind of talking about this exhibit that I expected that it would be red and white, blue and white, green and white, mm -hmm. yellow and white. And when so many of them came and they were two colors and not white, I was really kind of taken aback by that. Um, so I think that's an interesting addition to this exhibit. This one in the center, um, I believe is the one that I have um, identified as the oldest one in the exhibit. And I think that it's 18, 56, I think is ish what you have it dated at. Yeah. And nice. this green and pink one is um, kind of charming as well. I, I like green and pink combination. Um, there's a fantastic story about this one, um, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually looking at the back of this quilt, but we'll get closer pictures as we go along. So you mentioned that there are um, collections within your collection, um, Sarah. And so this exhibit is made up of quilts from three separate collections. Um, the ones we're looking at now are from the Robert and Artist James collection. Did I say those names correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then um, this is the pocket where I'm sitting. Yeah, and this is the Claire Vlasin collection. And then these four are from the Helen Erickson collection. Um, and Helen is a um, more contemporary, these are more contemporary quilts made in the 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, she was a, a maker and collector. So most of those are her own creations. 
I did some experimenting with this kind of wonky panoramic view. So the floor bends um, as I'm, this is kind of a, I don't know, not quite a 360, but a 270 degree view of our gallery. One of the neat things about the inner, at the Iowa Quilt Museum, if you haven't ever been here, um, we're located in this old um, storefront on the historic town square and there's a mezzanine this was a JC Penney building for over 16 years, but we have this mezzanine, which is a floor between a floor. And so I can go up there and take photos. Um, and it's just a very different um, view than most people get in a museum of kind of that eye level. So I really enjoy mm -hmm. being able to send people up stairs to get a kind of a bird's eye view of the gallery. So that's how I got this shot and this one. Also on our mezzanine, we have um, what's called a bed turning display. So we have an antique bed that's on, dis on loan to us from our local historical museum. We have five quilts layered on the bed and visitors can put on the white gloves and turn through those quilts one at a time. Um, we won't be looking at those quilts today. Um, they're from the collector, the collection of Julie Silber who lives in San Francisco. And she's become a good friend of ours as well. Remember um, viewers that you are welcome to um, chat in um, and give us things at the chat window. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do, was it? Shoot, view, full screen. I'm just trying to make it so I can see my chat window if anybody chats in. Nope, that's not it either. Oh, how do I go away? Rats. I can keep an eye on the chat if that helps. <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know how to get back to this. Oh, there we go. All right. But now I can't see. Oh, shoot. Sorry, everyone. Give me just a second to see if I can get back to where I want to be. Share screen, this one. Okay, now can you see my screen again? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so now we've got some close up pictures of each quilt in the exhibit. And so this is, imagine that you're here with me and Sarah and we're all gathered around this quilt, which of course we wouldn't be right now. Um, so, so what do you have to tell us about this beautiful um, feathered star? So this one is from the Robert and Artist James collection, and I will just explain that a little bit. I should have explained it earlier. So uh, Robert and Artists were collectors who um, had a really incredible quilt collection, um, over a thousand pieces, um, historic through contemporary quilts, and um, they donated them to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and helped us um, to eventually create our museum um, to have a building specifically built to house that collection. And um, they continue, their family continues to be involved um, and supportive of everything we're doing. So um, these, this quilt is from um, Robert and Artis's collection. Um, so it is, as Megan said, a feathered star. Um, it dates to about 1870. Um, it is cotton. I don't know. I'll probably just say the sizes here because I have them and I think it's, I don't know, I think it's kind of interesting. It gives you an idea um, just of how large it is. And um, so this is about 90 wide by 93 long. So pretty large quilt um, would have fit a large bed or really draped down pretty far to the floor on um, a smaller bed. Um, so this one, um, as I think I said, all, so all made of cotton. And um, so I think with this, you can really see with those tiny little pieces that, and um, if you can see, it's pretty densely quilted to, um, by hand and that would just be, I think you'd lose a lot of that visual impact if it had um, more colors. I think the, the two color works really beautifully here to really emphasize and really kind of um, bring out the dimension in those quilting stitches. And 
the kind of uh, visual dimension that's added in all of those tiny, perfect little points there. Yeah, these really are wonderful points. Um, I'm very jealous of, <laughs> of these points. And so you alluded, Sarah, earlier to the fact that not all of these are solid colors. And this is one mm -hmm. where there is a small pattern. And here's the downfall of looking at quilts through photographs that it just mm -hmm. is not clear enough to see quite what it is. But you can see that there's actually a small um, print in this mm -hmm. navy blue. Um, so it's not really a solid blue, but it reads that way. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to jog my memory on some of these, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marlene says, what is the size of those small half square triangles? Oh, um, that's a good question. It is. Okay. Marlene, so... let's, let's wrap back to that and I can go over um, maybe a little bit afterwards and just maybe give you a live shot with my finger next to it or something. That's a good idea. I was trying to do the math <laughs> and divide the 90 by 93. It's, what fraction of that is it? Yeah. I think your plan is a lot better. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can figure out how to get to the next photo. Oh, yes. Here we go. So these next, I, I believe I've got all of the Robert and Artist James collection together. Um, so that'll be the first several quilts that we go through. Perfect. Okay. So this one is a streak of lightning pattern. Um, it dates to about 1875 to 1895. So this one is a little smaller. It's about 76 by 78 and a half and um, possibly made in Berks County, Pennsylvania. So when we say um, possibly, that means that's where it was found and purchased. Um, so obviously it didn't necessarily, it's possible basically that it came from there. Um, if I say probably, that means um, that that's the information that came from whoever the quilt was acquired from. And then we say probably, and if we know absolutely for sure we have documentation, then we just say made in. So um, this one was purchased by the Jameses in Berks County, Pennsylvania, or at least by the dealer they got it from there. Um, so I think there's a pretty decent chance it's consistent with, um, with that. So I think it's very possibly from there, but um, this is another one that is made entirely of cotton. And I think probably almost all of these are, that's the most common um, material that we see because it was cheap and available. And um, it has generally, it stands up really well, as you can see um, to kind of the ravages of time in comparison to some other more delicate fibers. So you can just barely see the border of this mm -hmm. quilt um, and that's actually the entire backing. Um, I believe it's a, um, the back is brought around to make the binding. Um, I should have said binding, not border. Um, but it's a really, yeah, it's kind of a, a burgundy floral is the backing and the binding. It's a really um, interesting color choice for the backing. <laughs> So one of the things that we debated quite a bit when we were doing discussions about our um, last exhibit, which was the out of control, is how many of these choices were made out of necessity um, and how many of them were deliberate artistic choices. Um, and so I think that we can do that here too. You know, this, Marianne calls it this incongruous um, backing. <clears throat> she just put that in the chat window. Um, was that an intentional choice because somebody just has a bit of a sense of humor or because it's backing fabric and you need quite a lot of it? Um, is that what was on the sale rack or that was something that was gifted to you? And because you don't really see the backing, um, it's okay to do that. So I like to, you know, when I don't have the information available, I like to conjecture. I don't know how you feel about that, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, as long as you're labeling it conjecture, I don't absolutely, see <laughs> absolutely. I always say this is my opinion, my conjecture. Um, but I just think it's fun to kind of create a story of yeah. of how that choice would have been made or why that came up across. Um, Definitely. Barb Garrett has written um, that from her experience, Pennsylvania quilts, quote, usually have print backs. Is that something you have found to be true, Sarah? Yeah, we definitely see a lot that do. Um, and I'm thinking of one, I'm not sure whether it's from Pennsylvania or not, but I'm thinking of like one brown and white Rob Peter to pay Paul that we have in the permanent collection. And the front of it is, um, it's like brown and white calico, so it's not super exciting. And then on the back, it has um, this older, probably, I believe it's like 20, we think 20 or 30 years older than the um, base of the quilt, a uh, chintz print on the back that has like uh, all these hunting scenes with like um, people on horseback and elephants and dogs um, going on a boar hunt. And um, it's really just a really wild, violent kind of contrast to this very staid front of the quilt. And so hmm. I am always curious about that too. And I think um, I did an artifact analysis on that quilt um, a few years ago in grad school. And, and one thing that I thought about with the quilts that have a very different backing is um, if you think about the way they were actually used, then a lot of the time that's the part you actually see as you're pulling the quilt up um, to yourself in a bed or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You see the front or the back at least as much as you see the front. And so that's kind of um, a, a perspective on the quilt quite literally that we don't see when we, um, when we see quilts in the museum. Sure. Yeah, I think that's why, partially why the bed turning display here is so popular because yeah. people get to actually see the backs of them. Um, and sometimes the back is great because it has a nifty backing fabric. Sometimes the back is great because it doesn't have a pattern mm -hmm. and you can really appreciate and see the detail in the quilting stitches. Um, so there's two reasons. I know I always like when I find a quilt that's got a nifty um, kind of backing on it. So I, I, I see the allure of that. Here's my button. All right, so this is the one where I have literally never seen a pattern quite like this. Um, so I'm interested in what you can tell us about this one, Sarah. So this is um, another from the James collection and the pattern is known as a carpenter's square. We have a few in our collection and they are almost always um, two color and you can kind of see why um, mm -hmm. it can be a little bit visually overwhelming to stare at even with just mm -hmm. two colors. Um, and it, um, I honestly don't know, I've never tried to piece one of these. So I don't know whether it's one of those patterns that looks incredibly complicated, but is pretty straightforward when you're putting it together or if it's really as difficult as it looks. Anybody who's had experience putting together a carpenter's square quilt, feel free to let us know in the chat um, what that process is like. But um, so yes. yeah, I, I find these quilts really, really beautiful and fascinating. And really, um, I often feel like the thing that holds me back from making my own quilts is the amount of math. And I think this one is uh, definitely <laughs> no exception to that. Um, there's yeah. an awful lot of straight lines and corners that have to come out just right to make this look as it does. I stood for quite a while because as is often the case with a pattern like this, um, it's a little bit hard to see where the block actually is. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's super obvious and other times it's not. So I spent with a guest um, quite a bit of time standing and looking at this one and trying to see if I could figure out where exactly the block was. Um, and now that I'm looking at it again, I've got no idea. I can't tell you <laughs> at all what I discovered, um, except that I think that this square right here that I'm kind of circling with my little mm -hmm. hand is not the block. Um, I think that that comes from multiple blocks being put together. Um, 
Randall Parkin, who is our board president right now, has just put in the chat window that a visitor to the museum last week said she had made one and that it was not difficult, but that you have to keep really organized. Um, I bet. <laughs> that would be I a think, problem for me too. <laughs> yeah, I think there's different blocks that you make and then you have to put them together just right. Um, and we've all seen quilts, especially historic quilts, um, where there's one block that's turned the wrong way mm -hmm. or it's reversed. Um, and actually there's one in this collection where I can point that out. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you don't, especially in the absence of a design wall, um, yeah. And if you're working, you know, many of us have quilting studios now. Um, if you're working on the kitchen table between meals or on the living room floor um, while everybody's out of the house for a couple of hours, um, you know, you come and go and you take it out and you put it away and it's, it's amazing. Marianne has commented that what's amazing to her is that the quilt makers of the 19th century invented these patterns figured out how to make them without the use of graph paper, et cetera, and then gave them marvelous names. I think that is yeah. clever. And another, you know, another reason why we feel it's important to promote um, quilting and quilters um, because they're so inventive and ingenious and oftentimes in the telling of history um, and art, it, this particular art and history gets you know, um, marginalized a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I think something um, that kind of reminded me, um, so this dates to about 1890, we think. And um, so something that may have contributed to quilts like this or quilts like um, the mathematical star is that um, there was this push in young women's education for them not just to be learning. They still were learning a lot of hand needlework and things like that in the 19th century, but also um, there was this push to have an educated Republic. And so women were learning um, a lot more math, a lot more geometry. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think you can really see that sometimes expressed in these complex quilt patterns that aren't just um, maybe, you know, applique flowers or something like that, or, you know, the or rotary purse or um, like chintz applique type stuff, but that um, mm -hmm. the patterns that used a lot of really kind of complicated calculations to make the pattern turn out right. Um, yeah. I think you can see that as a reflection of kind of a, a change in the education that these people making the quilts were and had been receiving at the time. Well, the other thing that's always kind of amazed me is to look at um, what was considered a pattern um, at certain periods in time. You know, when mm -hmm. I look at a quilt pattern, um, I expect extremely detailed and step-by-step -step instructions. Um, and even then I usually have to call either Randall or Marianne to help me. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of assumed knowledge and there was a lot of assumed, um, you know, I'm gonna give you a, pretty much a sketch of this Mm -hmm. and you're going to figure it out. You're going to, you're going to know how to make it happen. So, yeah. I'm just looking at the clock and I've, I've set the pace a little bit slow for us at this point. It's already 1145. Okay, I um, will. And, and we, we certainly do not have to keep it to an hour. Um, but I'll try to just talk a little bit less and let you, you do the talking, Sarah. All right, sorry, I'm just trying to find this one. Okay, so this dates to about 1875 to 1895, possibly made in Pennsylvania um, and just a kind of classic center diamond with the addition of these, this sort of bilaterally symmetrical floral botanical design added on there. Um, just kind of a classic, Amish style quilt. Um, and I think there's another center diamond in here that doesn't have um, those kind of floral embellishments. And I think that it's interesting to contrast them. Um, I don't know, I think they're both beautiful, but... Um, oh, sorry, Barb. <laughs> okay, not Amish. Um, this one, okay. So we believe it was made in Pennsylvania. 
um, our information differs a little bit. Um, so this is another one that's um, cotton and you can see just the maker has used this kind of sawtooth, these sawtooth edges. So again, more of these just really fine, um, really carefully made points um, mm -hmm. so that they are, um, so that the overall look is kind of this great contrast between these sharp points and these sort of um, more gentle and rounded flower and leaf shapes, which I think is really kind of fun. And a center dime wouldn't, wouldn't always include all of this sawtooth work, right? I mean, that's right. kind of like yeah. an elevated, like take this from intermediate to advanced or from really yeah. from advanced to like expert level, mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking of video game terminology, this is a <laughs> level of quilting. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. Quilting anyway. For sure. Yeah. If you are a follower of Joe Cunningham, Joe the Quilter Cunningham, um, he visited us a few weeks ago, um, did a little video with me, and he talked quite a bit about um, this quilt. Again, his um, perception of this with information that he knows, he also speculated that it may be from the Lancaster County area um, based on what he knows. But um, anyway, it's a fine example of a quilt. and. Um, you know, red and green is kind of fun this time of year as we're approaching yeah. Christmas. Yeah, I I enjoy them. Um, it's fun to see sometimes the uh, red and green quilt that isn't a uh, red and green applique. I feel like we see lots and lots of those, but it's a little bit more mm -hmm. unusual in other styles. Well, and I asked Joe when he was here if he thought maybe that the green was a, a fuged, um, that it maybe was black at first. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't think so. Sarah, are, do you guys think that this was originally a green fabric? Um, I honestly am in front of you. It's probably hard to say. Yeah, I am not sure um, on this one. I don't think that we've necessarily, this one had, I don't believe has ever been exhibited before. Um, so I don't think it's been, this is one that I pulled from permanent to cool. education. And so I, I don't think anybody's done a, a very, close analysis of it yet, but we definitely should because we don't see a lot of greens that hold up as well as this seems to have. And it would make a lot of sense if it were um, of a faded black. Mm -hmm. But it, if it is faded black, it has faded really evenly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it really looks like it could have been green either way. Speaking of green. Mm -hmm. All right, find my information on this one. Okay, so this is a drunkard's path. Um, we've got it dated to circa 1885 to 1905. It's about 87 by 87. So another pretty large one, um, possibly made in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and another from the James collection. Um, so kind of a fun, unusual color combination here. Megan, you're gonna have to jog my memory. I feel like that purple might be a print. Is it's that not, right or it's nope, not? It's okay, not. I guess I'm just seeing the quilting stitches there. Yep. Um, so yeah, kind of, we don't see a lot of um, purples in um, quilts of this era, or if we do, it's, you know, smaller pieces and we definitely don't see a lot of purple and green combinations. So I was kind of delighted by this one. Yeah, so here's another, here's a good example, Sarah, of what we were talking about with the, where is the actual block, right? Mm -hmm. um, because a drunkard's path block, I don't know if I can zoom in well enough, is actually a block with a corner missing. Um, and so when you put them together in different orientations, you get this, you know, kind of weird, <laughs> I don't know, this secondary pattern, it's not weird, mm -hmm. this secondary <laughs> pattern, um, but it's, it's symmetrical and it's asymmetrical all at the same time. And it's just, it's really a wonderful pattern. And then this, um, what is this design, quilting design in the border? Is that a carpenter's braid? Is that what we call that? Um, I can't quite, can't see, quite see it, it. here, sorry. Uh, 
Oh yeah. Barb's calling it a cable. cable. Yeah. Yeah. I think it has several names, but yeah. Like so many things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the purple and green, it's just really, um, especially for that time period, I was really surprised when I saw that. Now, I'm not a quilt historian by any means and do not purport to be one, mm -hmm. um, but over the course of the last four years and 17 exhibits, I've started to see, you know, certain things over and over again, yeah. um, but nothing like this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a pretty fun one. Let me see. This is the one that I mentioned earlier is the oldest um, in this particular collection, this particular exhibition, <clears throat> another feathered star with a great <clears throat> feathered wreath um, that we often see in these big open spaces, these big empty blocks. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so this one we have dated to about 1860 to 1880. And this one's about 82 by 81, um, possibly made in Ohio and part of the James collection again. So you can kind of see, which I think had they used say uh, a print for the areas that are white, it would be pretty impossible to see um, those quilting stitches, but you can really see they really pop out there. The quilting pattern does um, with, the simplicity of the design. And so um, it kind of, I think often the pieced pattern kind of takes visual precedence over the quilting, but um, the way that this person has put this quilt together um, kind of equalizes the quilting and the piecing, which I think is really interesting to look at. Just all of a sudden right now, it kind of strikes me as a big tic-tac-toe board. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if she had put those um, stars on point. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good example. As I mentioned, we don't do uh, conservation. So you can see there are a few stains on this quilt and that's true of a lot of our quilts, including in the permanent collection. Um, we don't ever wash a quilt. The only cleaning we do is vacuuming. Um, and the reason for that is just that even getting the quilt wet can start a chemical reaction with those stains or dyes that then we don't have any way of stopping. And so it can do a lot more damage. So we consider those stains just part of the story of the quilt. And this is the last one in the James collection, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I might have just fibbed. <laughs> oh, come on. Got my document out of order here. Sorry. Remember. This one's more of a, it's not cotton, which is not atypical of a log cabin, if I mm -hmm. understand. Right, yeah. Um, so you're right, this one is wool, and that is more, we do see that in a lot of log cabins. Um, and this is not maybe the most traditional log cabin um, in that we don't have, you know, the little red center block for the hearth and all of that, but it is pieced um, in a log cabin pattern. So those would be foundation pieced rather than um, pieced together and then have batting added. Each strip is added to a um, a foundational square and then those are put together. So we have this one dated to roughly 1870. Um, our information is that it's possibly Mennonite and probably made in Frederick County, Maryland. And as Megan said, another from the James collection. Um, so it's about 73 by 80. So a little smaller than some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this one's interesting because I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily think of black and brown as making a very interesting or dynamic quilt, but I think that kind of dimensionality and texture of the log cabin pattern um, really helps this one kind of maintain that visual interest and um, still be kind of pretty compelling, even though it's made with these colors we might generally think of as a little bit more drab. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite things about having an exhibit up for a period of time is that I look at these quilts, you know, hundreds of times over the course of the exhibit. Um, but now that I'm sitting here staring at this one more closely, some of the center squares are the tan or the brown and some of them are the, the black. And I was trying to see if there was a, I think they're alternating, but I can't quite, I'd have to go through the whole thing, but <laughs> and anyway, half of her blocks had a brown center and it looks like half of them had a black center. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how it makes almost a basket weave mm -hmm. pattern. Yeah. And, mm, oh, this is still the James collection. So I'm trying in the gallery trying to figure out where this one is. So this mm -hmm. is the other center diamond that you alluded to. Obviously yeah. it doesn't have the, the sawtooth. Mm -hmm. um, and this one's quite a bit smaller than the other one. Yes. So this one um, we have also listed as a Kentucky peony, which I believe is mm -hmm. the name for the um, the applique floral pieces. And yeah, like you said, quite a bit smaller. This one's about 72 by 72 and quite a bit newer. And this one dates to about 1910 to 1930. So you can see this is another of those designs that's really pretty lasting. Um, mm -hmm. It wouldn't be, wouldn't necessarily look out of place today. Um, right. And so, um, yeah, this one also probably Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, or sorry, possibly Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, and then, yeah, just a very, very classic blue and white but I think again it really you're really able to see those quilting stitches um they really kind of pop out when you're just looking at a very simple quilt yeah there's this great kind of laurel you know chain along the mm -hmm. the edges the border um but I love these little fans I hope everybody else can see them these little fans in the, the blue part, they're just, they're just darling. And then the, the checkerboard, the straight lines, quite straight. She's I know. <laughs> really. It's like a piece of notebook paper. <laughs> yeah. And then in the border, they go diagonally. She just was really a very, um, a gifted and um, accurate quilter. Mm -hmm. I do love the blue and white. Our very first exhibit here at the Quilt Museum was um, red and white. And it's just so striking to see the gallery all in the two colors. Um, it was just totally cool. Blue and white is awesome though too. Yeah. All right, here's that. Here's this one where we literally have it turned backwards so that the featured piece is or the featured bit is this kind of bird of paradise mm -hmm. red work at red work um embroidery which is on the back of this beautiful drunkard's red and white drunkard's path the the front of the quilt is beautiful too but what do you know about this one um we don't know a huge amount this is another from the james collection and we know it was possibly made in pennsylvania we have it dated to 1900 to 1920 ish um and this is another one where it's just yeah it's hard to know um that certainly looks the bird of paradise certainly could be older so this could be an existing piece that somebody just decided to use to back a quilt um or it could be contemporary they could have embroidered it at the same time for this express purpose we just we don't know, um, but I think it's really lovely and um, just so both sides are kind of um, striking in their own way. And yeah, I, I like how you've exhibited it there so you can see the other side, that's great. Yeah, um, and it's fun to just to see without any color to see what this quilting looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see my finger. To see what this quilting looks like on the back. 
um, of the drunkard's path because if it has a very distinctive quilting, you know, pattern to it. Yeah. Now this drunkard's path, the blocks are more in keeping with the size that I think we typically see for drunkard's path. That purple and green one, those were pretty tiny blocks um, for a drunkard's path. This mm -hmm. is much more what I've seen anyway. Yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. I have to get all the way zoomed out before it will let me go to the <laughs> next picture. <laughs> Okay, find this one. This one I feel may have been made, again, my conjecture, mm -hmm. um, could have been made for, you know, a little girl's bed or, mm -hmm. um, you know, something like that. I just see it being a, that kind of application anyway. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. And this is another kind of like the green and purple, just kind of a combination you wouldn't necessarily expect, but it's kind of sweet in its own way. Um, so this one we have dated to 1865 to 1885 um, and probably made in Ohio. Um, we have the, then I think this was um, information from the dealer that the James family purchased it from, but possibly made by M. Yoder and possibly quilted by M. Yoder. But that is all the information that we have about the maker. Um, so this is another cotton one and um, it is a little bit smaller than some of them, about 67 by 78. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's kind of a and very sweet little piece. Yeah, I think the green is a print. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is a double pink print, mm -hmm. although there's, there's so much texture from the quilting. Um, it's hard to tell. It's yeah. a little bit hard to tell in the photo. Um, this one has been, I think, washed because it's got that kind of nice, you know, pucker that comes, but yeah. yeah. Cute. Okay, I said before that we were at the end of the James collection and obviously I was mistaken. Um, <laughs> well, but I think we have just a lot of their quotes. <laughs> I think we have just one more. I think this was actually the end of, <laughs> of that bit. So all right. Uh, yes, the Rob Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, so we have two of this design um, in this exhibit. We have a red and white and a blue and white, and they're quite different from each other, except that. Um, the design of the block is the same, but this is the one that I was saying is such a, uh, it's just a shoe in for two colors. Mm -hmm. um, like I think if you did more colors in this, it would just almost be too much. Yeah, definitely. So this one uh, we have dated to 1880 to 1900, roughly. This is another one on the smaller side. It's about 65 by 75, um, made of cotton. Let's see you can see pretty clearly and um, possibly made in Wabash County, Indiana. Um, so this one is another, I feel like a really great example of that kind of positive negative space dynamic that we were talking about earlier. It depends on which part of the quilt or which part of the block you stare at it kind mm -hmm. of makes the other color recede or um, come forward. And it's kind of easy to get lost in. It is on my screen, the zoomed in, I don't know if it's the light in my eyes or what, but it's, I'm kind of getting that, um, I don't know, stripes in my vision or something oh, no. because of the stark contrast between yeah. the two colors. Yeah. But I love, I love this pattern. Um, mm -hmm. You said Rob Peter to pay Paul. It's also called orange peel. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah it is. Okay, so this is the first one in the Helen Erickson collection. And we've had lots of guests spend several minutes in front of this one trying to figure out what all of the, um, what each of the blocks is, what's the nursery rhyme it's referring to. Oh, that's um, fun. Yeah, so we've gotten several of them figured out. Um, you know, little Bo Peep over here and, um, 
let's see maybe peter peter pumpkin eater here's jack and jill um the queen of hearts little miss muppet oh let's see humpty dumpty um little boy blue go blow your horn uh, little jack horner sat in the corner so anyway it's it's fun. been a lot of fun to try to identify oh, that's great them. Yeah, so this one um, was not made by Helen, but um, she, as I mentioned, she collected quilts as well. So she acquired this one in about 2000, um, and it is the Mother Goose pattern from Ruby Short McKim from roughly 1920. So we think this was probably made between 1920 and 1940. Um, and yeah, just a sweet little red work. We have a, in addition to that bird of paradise, we have this one and then one more red work, which I think is um not necessarily what we think of when we think of two color quilts but I think they are they definitely have their place and mm -hmm. they're really fun I think to see the creativity and the designs um that in this case the pattern maker came up with and someone else embroidered um, mm -hmm. so that's super fun that you've identified a bunch of those nursery rhymes. So this is another, a pretty small, definitely, as you might guess, a child's quilt, um, about 47 by 76. Um, and this one has no batting um, mm -hmm. that I can discern. It's just yeah, it um, a front and uh, probably, a, you know, another piece of muslin on the back. So it would be quite lightweight. And here's that other, the red and white, um, orange peel or Rob Peters mm -hmm. PayPal. The thing I love about this one is that the edge was left in the scallop um, mm -hmm. instead of finished off to square corners. I love it. I would never do it. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not at this stage in my quilting life, but I do love it. Yeah, I think that is really fun. It really gives it a fun kind of textural element. So this one mm -hmm. was made by Helen. Um, in Emporia, Kansas in 1977. And so um, as we kind of were talking about earlier, that other uh, Rob Peter de Paypal was much earlier. So it's really a pattern that has lasted. Um, and this one, I mean, even this one is um, several decades old at this point, but looks, I mean, could be brand new. Um, it, it definitely doesn't look dated in the way that sometimes we might think of a 1970s quilt as looking at this point. Um, right. I do feel like two color quilts tend to hide their age, both, um, both looking sometimes newer and sometimes older than they mm -hmm. actually are. Yeah. Somebody has figured out how to draw on our screen. Cool. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> so this is probably, as I'm looking around, this one is the print, the, the printiest print yeah. um, in the blueprints. But in the photos a little bit, it's a little bit bright, maybe overexposed. But um, when I'm looking at it in person, actually, it's right over here it still reads very much blue and white. Yeah, and this is another one by Helen. Um, it is a storm at sea pattern and um, she created it between 18, no, sorry, not 18, 1982 <laughs> and 1992. Um, and so, yeah, as Megan said, you can definitely see that there's more of a print happening here, um, but it still reads pretty, pretty two colored um, mm -hmm. from a little ways away. So kind of a good example of how you can use even a fairly obvious print and still um, the way that the quilt might read from, you know, across the room or a few steps away can be kind of different. Um, and this is another one I think Helen was really interested in these patterns that um, really, um, really kind of rely on that 
positive negative space dynamic like the Rob Peter to pay Paul and, and then this one um, depending on how you look at it you know you can kind of follow the curves and it looks um, you can find overlapping circles or you can follow the straight lines and see a bunch of um, like adjacent yeah. squares it's kind of it is similar to the Rob Peter to pay Paul in that way I guess I think I've never seen the circles before until you said that. I've always just seen the blocks individually. Um, but now that you say that, I can totally see the circles. Yeah, it's kind of fun. It is. I love that. I love that kind of optical illusion mm -hmm. with ones like this. That's one of my favorite parts about um, when we unpack quilts and then when I get them up on the wall, when we're installing an exhibit, is you unpack it. And first of all, it's like Christmas morning every single time. It's like, mm -hmm. Ooh, ah. And then you lay it out on a table and you get a little bit better view of it. But then as soon as you get it up on the wall and take a couple steps back, oftentimes it's an entirely different quilt. It's true. Um, yeah. I think that That's often true. when we do object reviews and we have a quilt out on the table for measurements and to make sure the condition is okay. And I think, oh, it's fine. And then when it's up in the gallery and it's lit, right? And everything, it looks mm -hmm. completely different. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And this is the last one of the Helen Erickson collection. Um, and the, the only thing in my mind that, that dates this one a little bit is the fact that the red is a little bit on the warm side. It's a mm -hmm. little on the orangey side. It is um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so this is her sawtooth with feather rose. Um, so more of those perfect little points that we keep seeing. Um, yeah. This one is from 1976. Um, another that she made in Emporia, Kansas, where she lived. And um, yeah, you can really see, as Marianne noted, um, the hand quilting in this is really beautiful. Yeah, much more so we can see it in this one than the other one, which is a good case for having so much white um, yeah, so sure. much, or so much of the same color because you can see, look at these great straight lines, straight, straight, straight lines um, in this red area and with this beautiful um, kind of laurel chain over on the side. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just wonderful. She's obviously a very talented quilter. Yeah, she actually was designated a master folk artist in 1984 by the Kansas Historical Society. Um, so really, really talented. Um, and she also taught quilt making and quilt history across the country. Just a very, very fascinating lady. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have her whole collection? At the um, I don't think we have all of them, but we have gosh, I want to say 18 or 20 of her quilts. Um, nice. Quite a, quite a few. Okay, this is our last little bit. We've got about five quilts that are the Claire um, Velassen collection. Great. Just catching up here. Finding and while you're finding your spot, I'll point out, um, this is the one I was talking about that has a block in the wrong order. It's got a block that's turned. I won't point it out quite yet, but I will before I change the picture. <laughs> so this is a uh, Delectable Mountains, uh, circa 1875. Um, and as Megan said, it's from the Claire Vlasson collection. So um, Claire was a quilter and collector. Um, and she taught quilt making and um, also made and um, made her own quilts, taught quilt making and also held quilt history seminars um, where she would show quilts from her collection, antique quilts. And then um, all the money that she made off of that, she always gave to Habitat for Humanity, um, which is lovely. And so um, her family after she passed away donated several quilts from her collection to our museum and so um she definitely also had an eye for those two color quilts so mm -hmm. there are a few in here that i think are really beautiful really fun this one i feel like actually looks much bigger than it is um mm -hmm. so it's 76 by 84 but it definitely looks like 
it could be one of those over a hundred inchers. Um, mm -hmm. I think just the kind of visual impact of the pattern really makes it appear even larger than life. Right. Yeah, and it, she's added kind of a three piece border, um, mm -hmm. you know, which we sometimes see on bed quilts. Um, and then there's um, this blue over here doesn't quite belong. Um, <laughs> and then here, right here is the block mm -hmm. that's turned the wrong direction. Yeah. Just 90 degrees off. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't necessarily notice it when you first look. And as mm -hmm. soon as you see it, you can't unsee yeah, it. it. It really sticks out. Yes. So <laughs> I'm sorry to those perfectionists who are with us that I pointed it out to you. It's like pointing out to somebody that their lights are humming. <laughs> Thanks, I hadn't noticed it. <laughs> oh, come on. See, and then I zoom too far. Like. Mm -hmm. All right, pink and pink, love it. Oh yes, I love this one. So this is a star and crescent or star of the West from circa 1900 from the Claire Blossom collection. All we know is that it was, oops, you know what? I'm on the wrong quilt. I'm on the other pink one. Okay, sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. Ohio star. I was like, it doesn't look like a star and crescent. <laughs> okay, so this is circa 1920. Um, it is cotton. All we know is uh, made in the US and it's about 75 by 75. Um, so yeah, probably shouldn't have snuck this one in because technically it is just pink, but I really loved it. So <laughs> I decided it could slide under the radar here. Well, just like we've been saying with prints, I really think it reads as a two color quilt mm -hmm. because there is a difference in the value or the intensity of the two pinks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that could easily be a white background, uh, the yes, white where the lighter sure. pink is. Um, but it's just, you know, it's simple, um, but it's just very, I, I think of these quilts as iconically American quilts. Um, mm -hmm. You see this and it just, it just screams, turn of the 20th century, um, probably in the Midwest. I think you said Ohio star. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just wonderful. It's just classic and people really love these types of quilts. Yeah, it's very fun and sweet. Here's our last red work piece, which is, this one has been hard to photograph because it's literally just a quilt top. Yeah. Um, and so it hangs, um, hangs a little flimsy um, mm -hmm. and the light goes right through it. Um, but um, it's got some really interesting red work embroidery and it's several nice. dates that mm -hmm. are a little bit puzzling. Mm -hmm. um, so here's one here. I gotta make my chat window go away. Um, Clement, 1830. And we see Dora here. Um, and then Howard, I think that this is Snell and 1910 is here and Emma Deer, D-E-E-R-E, -E, -E -E, but no date <laughs> here. So it's just really interesting, you know, what exactly is the story that they're trying to tell us here? It's hard to know. Mm -hmm. It's true. And this is with a piece like this, we just have to date it at the latest date. Um, because obviously it's a million times more likely that people were putting meaningful dates in the past rather than ascribing a random future date. To <laughs> um, and so, yeah, this one is um, unfortunately, yeah, just the top or kind of a coverlet technically, I guess. I don't think it even has, I think the edges are folded over and stitched down, but that's the edges the are folded over and it's stitched down, but the back is, it doesn't have a second piece on it. Yeah. Even it doesn't even have a sheet on the back. You can see the seams on the back. It's, it's mm -hmm. really puzzling. Yeah. It, I think it is possible that someone did the finishing later just so that it was a little bit more usable, but sure. um, it was definitely a challenge for our sleevers. Um, normally <laughs> they are able to go through batting um, or at least a second layer to attach that sleeve, but trying yeah. to keep those stitches hidden, at least it's white. <laughs> that made it easier. Right. But, yes. um, yeah. Yeah. So um, just kind of a really fun and experimental 
piece mm -hmm. where somebody just did all kinds of strange, creative little designs on each block. Um, and again, conjecture on my part, um, but there's a repetition of some of the, the embroidery. So there's a repetition of this horse and there's a repetition mm -hmm. of this design, um, but they often don't look exactly, they look like it, they could have been done by a different person. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps this was a group quilt, maybe an embroidery lesson or, Very possibly, um, yeah. you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely possible. And, oh yes, okay, here's your star and crescent, which right, we just go. right over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I love this one. Yes, I do too. Okay, yeah, so this is the star and crescent or star of the West from about 1900, another from Claire's collection, um, made in the United States is all we really know. Um, it's cotton, it's about 76 by 93, so a little larger again. And just another one where I think that kind of positive negative element um, is really interesting to just kind of let your eye rest in different places and see what kind of pops out and what kind of recedes. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of. And I, I don't think I'll be able to zoom in far enough to really get it with clarity, but it's a wonderful double print or double pink print um, with the pink on pink. It's just really, it's really cool. And I, again, I don't think I've seen this pattern very often, this star and crescent or star yeah. and west, but I, I dig it. I like it. Yeah, it's really pretty. And I think that brings us to our last one, um, which is the churn dash over my left shoulder. Yeah. Churn dash is one of my favorite block patterns right now. Yeah, this is a fun one. So yeah, churn dash or monkey wrench. So circa 1890, um, another cotton made in the United States. And you can have to jog my memory again, Megan. Is this one a print too? It is, yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. So yeah, another that reads two color from a little further away, but um, has a little bit more going on the closer you get. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of print. It's kind of like a vine, vining with a little bit of uh, flower on it. I don't know if that's clear enough for anybody to see or not, but. Yeah. Yeah, so. This is another um, yeah. from Claire Blossom's collection. And so we have a few that she, oh yeah, that's great. You could really see it there. Um, we have a few that she made herself and then um, many that she collected and she had a really um, amazing home storage. Um, they built it, built her a huge basement studio and storage area. So she stored all of her antique quilts on rolls um, in dedicated storage space. Um, definitely probably rivaled some museums with <laughs> her, um, her storage area that she had. It was cool. pretty impressive, yeah. All right, so I'm back at the very first feathered star that we looked at um, because um, somebody had asked about the size of these okay. high square um, triangle blocks. So here is the tip of my finger. I think you're still screen sharing. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. All right. So I'm going to. And then I think you here, I'm going to take the spotlight off. There we go. Okay. There you are. All right. So now you can see me and this quilt. And here is, so I would say this is an inch across tops, an inch finished on this half square triangle. So it's pretty tiny. Here's my whole hand. We have a, um, we do accept a few donations of quilts, even though we don't have a collection of our own. And we're building a, a much smaller education collection that we can use for some programming as well. Um, but we have one that was gifted to us that's a nine patch. And the nine patch block itself is about the size of a quarter. It's oh my gosh. A little bit insane. <laughs> Oh, wow. So this is a good time, everybody, to go ahead and um, 
if you've got a question that you want to shoot out to Sarah or myself, um, please feel free to tap that into the chat window, or you can actually go ahead and unmute yourself right now if you'd like to. Um, I'm going to pop a few things in the chat window for everyone to see. Um, and mainly that's how to connect with us beyond today. Here is the Iowa Quilt Museum's web address. It's just iowaquiltmuseum.org. Um, and from there you can find exhibit information, you can find directions to get here, you can find um, our weekly blog, you can sign up for our email. Um, I shouldn't say weekly blog, it goes out a couple times a month. Um, if you want to see this video, you're gonna want to add backslash current exhibit to the end of that um, web address and that will take you to the page for this exhibit and the video. Um, we are so happy that everybody joined us today um, and we're so thankful that Sarah joined us. Um, our Joe the Quilter video is on the website. Yes, it is. Um, it's actually on our YouTube page, um, but you can access that from our website. Um, if you are so inclined to leave a monetary donation for us um, as appreciation for this exhibit, um, we would absolutely welcome that. There's a donate button on our website as well. Um, we are in the midst of a capital campaign to raise the necessary funds to do some improvements to the upstairs of our building. When we opened four and a half years ago, we spent all of our resources on the main floor, our exhibit space, and now it's time to do something to the upstairs of this historical building so that it doesn't deteriorate beyond repair and so that we can use it as um, exhibit preparation space and office space and some programming space as well. Um, so if you feel like you can make a donation, typically something like this, we would charge um, about $10, um, just to give you an idea. Our typical admission is $6. So um, if I don't see any more questions that are coming in for Sarah or myself, Sarah, do you want to give any closing remarks before we sign off? Um, I guess I would just say if you are interested, um, definitely check out our social media on Facebook and Instagram um, at International Quilt Museum. And then also um, we have a YouTube channel that has um, quite a bit of programming on it that we've put together, a lot of it just over the last several months of the pandemic. So um, everything from caring for your quilts at home to um, different First Friday lectures, interviews with artists. Um, I did um, a first Friday lecture on crazy quilts and mad women. That's kind of fun. Um, so definitely check that out if you are home in lockdown and need something else to watch. Absolutely. We appreciate that. Um, so I'm checking the chat window one more time. Great. Well, thanks so much everybody for being here again. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Um, we're yeah, just thank thrilled. You everyone. Yeah, we're just thrilled to be able to share this exhibit with you, even when um, you're not able to come in person. Um, but we do hope to welcome you in person sometime soon. In the meantime, keep checking in with us on social media and our website. Um, sign up for our email list if you're not on it. That is the best way to make sure you don't ever miss out on anything. Um, and we've we're just hit the 90 minute mark. So that seems like a good time to wrap things up. Have a lovely Wednesday, everybody. And I hope you all stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, Megan. Thank you.